Hello, and just in case that opening graphic has left you in any doubt at all, you are indeed watching the Power Hour. Yes, this is TaxCalc's exclusive monthly best practice workout where we get together and share advice on how everyone can get more from their favorite software. So welcome all, especially to our regulars. I believe uh, Anne White is watching. Hello, Anne. Uh, Vicky and Natalie, you know who you are. Uh, I imagine Sarah Solo is hanging out in the chat as well. Um, and if, also, if this is your first Power Hour, uh, welcome to the club. In particular, Andrew Haig uh, and Sharon uh, from Compton Hardwick. Hello, it's great to see you at FAB. Uh, and like I said, if you've got any more questions, this is where you can ask them. Uh, so today we've got a very full agenda. Uh, I'm joined by Dean Shepherd, possibly the best director of client engagement that there is. Uh, and by popular demand, Martin Davey, who heads up our product development uh, for our practice management suite, is on hand. Uh, he's going to talk through the developments around Practice Manager Plus, and he can answer questions about comm centre, time, and, and all the rest. Uh, as always, though, it's all about you, uh, our customers. Uh, if you've got any questions where the tax count can do that thing, you always suspected it might, but you've never found the button, this is for you. Uh, as always, we're going to be focusing on the chat uh, for this session. Uh, you can find that in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Uh, there is the questions option, uh, but that can't be seen by the rest of the audience. So only use that if you want to say something privately to us. Um, and yes, a recording will be sent out. You can go back and rewatch all the golden nuggets of advice that we're going to offer. Uh, and as always, yes, there will be a little bit of a quiz too. So without a doubt, without uh, well, further delay, uh, I think we'll go into quiz question one. So get onto the chat, get you warmed up. Uh, quiz question one uh, is, we're going to go with a kind of um, closest answer wins uh, and you get points. There may even be a prize. Um, and this tees in with what Dean's going to be talking about. But in what year was the current 6th of April start of the tax year established. So when was 6th of April established as the start of the tax year? Throw in your answers into the chat. Sarah, straight off, to, off the blocks there. Keep them coming. We've got, we've got a, a wide range here. Now this is where we always forget. It all goes mad in the chat and we can never, we'll never work out. Sarah, you're not having another fleece. That's not fair. Okay, we've got a few answers there. The, the, the actual answer, oh, you're, if you want to know the question, the question is, when was the 6th of April established as the uh, beginning of the tax year? Where, what year was it established as the beginning of the tax year? I know a few of you missed the, the question there. Got a lot of answers coming in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you out of your misery. We are looking at the actual, it was actually formalized in 1800. And it is a fascinating story. And I think, um, is it Robin has got some, did a bit of a lecture on that for you? Uh, yes, Robin Milstead did a yeah. viral YouTube uh, video, I think, that explains why we have 6th of April as the start date of the tax year. It's Let's worth a look. Look that one up. Is it in one year they actually removed 11 days from September? Um, which caused some consternation and a riot, I think. But the actual answer was, it was actually formalised in 1800. Um, so we have got... We had Tony Pierce very early on with uh, 1795. I don't think I saw anyone... I think closer. we're going to give Tony... This is not a scientific uh, quiz, but I think we're going to give Tony the, uh, the point on that one. Well done, Tony Pierce. Congratulations. So, excellent. So that leads us on, though, doesn't it? Like a, like a subtle shoehorn. It does somewhat lead us on. Because you wanted to talk to us a little bit about the new toy that you've, you've developed in, um, in, in tax return production. So Yes, uh, and that's all about basis period reform. Um, you may notice in the centre of your screen is down to the bottom, you've got a little React option. So just click on whatever your reaction is when anyone comes to you and talks to you about basis period reform. Um, hopefully lots of smiley faces and little, little uh, party poppers going off. Um, for those that are really excited about basis period reform. Everyone's um, crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a few thumbs up, that's good, that's good. Okay, so what I'm going to do is dive into tax return production and cover off four different scenarios that you are likely to face in your practice uh, when it comes to 
looking at basis period reform. So we're going to, going to tax return production. Um, now the very first scenario is, in my book, the ideal scenario in that your clients were already using a 5th of April year end or somewhere between 31st of March and 5th of April, uh, in which case you don't need to worry about basis period reform at all. Please post a number one in the chat if all your clients already have, or I'd say all your um, uh, sole traders and partners partnerships already have 5th of April year ends, so basis period isn't a problem. Just fire a number one into the chat. I'd like to see who's, uh, who's managed to escape this transitional year of basis period reform. Uh, for everyone else, I'm going to dive into scenario number two that you might face, which is where you have a non-5th of April accounting period for your client, and you're going to extend that so that you've got a long period of account. So I'm going to create a new tax return for 2024 because I've updated to the latest tax cap release and go into this tax return. So I'm going to use simple step and I'm going to go down to work and this client of mine is Abbott's Ale. And as you can see, they've got a 31st of December 23 ordinarily uh, year end. I've already done the accounts in accounts production, so I'm just going to bring those figures in. And you can see rather than the year to 31st of December 23 that I otherwise would have done, um, because of basis period reform, I'm going to do, or I've done a long period of account, just over 15 months, uh, to 5th of April 24, and I'm going to bring those figures in. And while I bring those figures in, we've got a little, little question for you. Um, what is the longest period of account that you can have uh, in this transitional year of basis period reform. So in this example, I've got 15 months and five days. What is the absolute longest period you can have um, to create a valid transitional year tax return? I'll let you ponder that and pop your answers into the chat and Andy can keep, answers, keep your eye on those. Right, so I'm gonna pull in all these figures. Uh, and we can see that my Counting period there has changed. It's updated with the counting period that I've done there. What, what have we got in the answers? Anything interesting? We've got, oh, right. Three months, 18 months. So well, a yeah. lot of big, basically the split is between 23 and 18. And then there's a few other uh, interesting ones. 729 days is coming up. 729 days. We've had a few of those. Those are the smart cookies, but you are one day out. I think because it's a leap year, um, and we can run from 7th of April, if you had an awful year end of 6th of April, up to 5th of April 24. Yep, Chris has come in there with the right answer. It would be 730 days is the maximum length of period that you can have. If anyone's thinking about the 18-month rule maximum length, that doesn't apply uh, for 23, 24 in this transitional period. So you can make that accounting period as long as you like. Um, so Chris Fleming is officially able to tell his family he is the best. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, good. Absolutely. Well done, Chris. Well done, Absolutely. Chris. OK, so we've brought in these figures for the long accounting period. Um, if I go down to the full form, we've got our basis period option here in the simple step. Uh, these are all the boxes that you need to complete for the transitional year. So we've got our standard profits at the top. We've got our transitional profits in the middle. That's the profits that you can spread over five years. Uh, and then if you've got any pesky overlap profits brought forward and you've been able to obtain those from HMRC, if they've long since been lost, uh, then that appears in the bottom. So you could manually type in those figures, um, but I'm going to use the calculator, if I tick the little yes uh, to that box. And as we can see, we've got the length of accounting period here. That has been split between the first 12 months and the second period up to uh, 5th of April 24. So that is your split between your standard profits and your transition profits. Um, off of that transition profit, we're going to deduct the overlap profits that we've got brought forward. And what we're left there, the 5984, that is the transition part that you can spread over five years. So we've got that nice little calculator that does that all for you. And I have to say, extending the accounting period rather than doing two is the easiest option for you um, if, if you're having to do this for clients. Uh, we have created a little report, so I'll just preview that report. Um, might just be one for the file that gives all the breakdown in, in great detail, but if you do have clients that like to see the full detail of everything that's calculated on the return, then you can provide that to your clients. So if I come back out of the calculator, now we've also got a transition profits wizard because you do have the option of accelerating those uh, that five-year spread, if you like, if you think it beneficial for your 
client. Um, we have got an override buck, so you could just type over rather than 1196. Uh, you could increase that figure. But we do have a little wizard that does all the calculations for you. So if, in this instance, um, let's say I wanted to actually do it all in one hit. I don't want to worry about carrying forward the amount and, and spreading it. Uh, and it's beneficial for my client tax-wise, perhaps only basic rate this year, but higher rate taxpayer uh, in the next year. Then I can add that figure in there and um, do away with the carrying forward of the, that transition profit. Um, if let's say I just want to bring it up to uh, another figure, then we'll redig all the calculations for you so that you're carrying forward the right amount. And then in next year's um, tax return production, we'll, ha we'll have that figure and, and do the same process again for the next four years. So it'll all be saved there in the system and uh, you won't have to worry about that. Um, and like the basis period calculator, we've done another report for the transition profit calculations. Again, probably just for the fire, but if you do have any particular clients that'd like to see all the detail, then that's quite a client-friendly report that you can use. So that is um, the easy scenario, number one. Uh, the most straightforward of scenarios. Please put a number two in the chat if you've got clients that are in that number two scenario. You're going to do an extended uh, accounting period to cover off basis period reform. Uh, I'm now going to show you scenario number three, which is my least favorite, which is where you've got multiple accounting periods. So I'm going to do a different client for this one. Quite a lot of fans of, of version two there. Yep. I, I, you know what, when we first spoke about basis period reform, I was a fan of version three, wasn't yeah. I? For very yeah. good reason yeah. that you can, uh, or I find that you can charge for two sets of accounts. Yes. If you're doing two accounting yes. periods. If you're doing an extended period, you're in all likelihood you're just going to charge for one set of accounts. As far as your client's concerned, one set of accounts is one set of accounts. And I think I called you, uh, I can't remember, grasping or something like that. Um, profiteering <laughs> was I think the <laughs> phrase you used. but. Um, Yes. When we were at the event, I was asking everybody, for people that turned up to the Festival of Accounting and Bookkeeping a couple of weeks ago, and by and large, everybody was going for the extending the accounting period, um, not going for two. But if you have gone for two, which you might well have done if you got something like an April year end, and April 23 ended um, some time ago, you might have knocked out those set of accounts, and now you're going to do the period from um, April 23 to 5th of April 24. I'll just explain to you why that is much more difficult and the process that you're going to have to go through if you choose to do that option. So um, as before, I should pull in a set of accounts from accounts production. So here we can see we've got the 12 months here and then the short period to 5th of April 24. So I'm going to pull that one in first. Uh, all those figures come in. Go down to the basis period boxes as before. Now, this time around, HMRC require us only to report the most recent set of accounts on the tax return where there are multiple accounts for a single trade. Um, they don't permit you to put both sets of accounts on a single tax return for a single trade. So I've got to explain to you the workaround that you'd have to apply to meet the HMRC filing criteria because they didn't create anything additional um, to support these changes for basis period reform. So what we're going to do is come down to the bottom here, further businesses, and I'm going to add another set of self-employment pages just for now. And I'm going to bring in that second set of accounts in the full form so that we've got everything on screen. I'll just expand these ones out again. Um, so from the first 12 month period, we've got the 37611 of profit there and 8400 of overlap profits brought forward. In the second set, if we go into our, uh, actually, I'll just put that start date of the base period in there, first of the first 23. Um, if I go into the calculator, um, we've actually got to copy across those figures from the first 12 months into this basis period section of the second set of accounts because you can only submit one and they want all the information uh, in the most recent set of accounts. So I shall put those figures in here. That's 37611. Uh, I think we had 8400 of overlap profits brought forward. And now this is going to calculate all the correct figures. Um, everything's gone into that 
second period. As before, we could adjust the transition profit amount uh, if you wanted to, but we're going to leave those as is. Uh, you'll notice that the tax has gone up quite considerably because this is now thinking we've got we've just doubled our profits and in two different self-employments. Um, so what we're actually going to have to do before we file um, this tax return anywhere is remove this first year. Now the reason I've actually bothered creating this first year in the first place, and I'll remove the 8400, is that HMRC actually require you to attach that first year as a PDF to the return. So you can't electronically file it um, like you would just as a su supplementary page because it doesn't want to in the same uh, for the same trade in the same year. But you're going to have to attach that information anyway as a PDF. Um, so to do that, I can go down to the check finish, print or paper file. Now I'm going to untick these options, um, just a selection of the tax return pages, and I can go to self-employment, expand that, and you can see that we've got six pages here, so three of those are for the first 12 months, three of those are for the uh, final period, so I'm just going to select those pages from um, the first 12 months. Create the preview, and then I'm going to save that. There are some rules about um, attaching PDFs to a tax return in terms of the naming convention. So uh, HMRC don't like capital letters, so we'll have to remove those. They don't like underscores, so we'll have to remove those. And there's a maximum 15 character limit. So uh, we have to change that a little bit. And that's that document saved. And then we can attach it here, add your own PDF attachment to the return. Here's a little reminder of those rules if you weren't aware of what the PDF rules were. Attach the PDF. Uh, you can make a note if you, if you like there. Um, I'd suggest putting a comment in the additional information box uh, that we can do here. Um, the HMRC, if people are aware of HMRC specials and exclusions, this is number eight. So you might want to pop that in there, HMRC special eight. Um, PDF accounts attached, something like that. And then before you file the return, now that you've attached that information, you need to go back into that first period uh, and delete that schedule. Now, if you're getting these to draft stage and you're going to send them to client for checking and things might change if you're sending the accounts out at the same time, then I would be tempted to go into the basis period item here minus that figure out so that you're going to get the right tax figure. You haven't doubled up your um, counting profits for that first 12, year, 12 years. And then if there are changes, you can come back in and change it without having to recreate um, that self-employment pages from, from scratch again. But you will have to remember to delete that schedule before you finally submit the tax return. So anybody who's excited about going for that option, hit a number three in the chat. I'll be interested to see if that hasn't put you off completely. Um, if you are in that scenario, so you have got multiple accounting periods for a single client, um, then our developers are currently working on a, um, a way to kind of make that a little bit automated. So it's not going to be quite the manual steps that you saw me do on screen. But I wanted to show you all manually so you understand the additional, additional work that you'd have to do um, if you've got two sets of accounts for a single period rather than just the one. So if that hasn't put you off completely, um, the final scenario I want to show you for basis period reform is uh, number four, and that is where your client is going to retain their non-5th of April year end. So in this case, um, if I, let me delete out that schedule. So let's say, I'm going to import the accounts to overwrite the information I've got here, but let's say this 5th of April 24 short period didn't exist. And this client just continued with a 31st of, 12, uh, 31st of December year end. We just have this set of accounts as normal. So we're going to overwrite those figures. And then this time, when we come down to the basis period section here, and we go into um, the calculator, Next year is also going to be 31st of December year-end because this client is going to retain that. So this time it's going to be for 2024. 
Um, and then you're going to have to put in an estimate, because obviously we're not at December 24 yet, you're going to have to put in an estimate of what you think the accounting profit is going to be for next year. Um, let's say the client thinks it's just going to be a little bit more than last year. So 40,000, that calculates all the correct figures. You can see it's taken 96 of the 366 days of that period and brought that in. And you're going to have to mark that figure there as provisional because we don't know yet. Um, the filing deadline for this return is 31st of January 25. That gives you a grand total of one month. That's a fairly quiet time of year, I'd imagine, January 25, uh, to get those accounts finalised and submitted if you want to beat that 31st of January filing deadline um, for the tax return. My suspicion is that you probably won't have the accounts prepared by then, so it is going to be um, those figures are going to have to be submitted after the 31st of January filing deadline uh, and perhaps some tax correction based on the, the estimate of tax that, that uh, the 40,000 gives to 31st of January 25. So I don't think this basis period form has been a great, uh, great move for those not wanting to use a 5th of April year end, um, but that covers all four scenarios in tax return production for covering those eventualities. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, apologies if you are um, experiencing uh, glitching. It looks like it's stabilised now. I'm not sure uh, what's caused that, but the the team are, are actively buzzing around trying to fix this. Uh, but I think we're stable now. I've got a couple of questions for you, Dean, that came in. Um, just to recap, do LLPs have to move their year end? Uh, Gosh, do LLPs have to move their year end? Um, I mean, no one has to move the year end because you can keep it as a non 5th of April. Um, yeah, the tax is transparent for LLPs. So they were doing a partnership tax return. So, yeah, part this applies, basic period reform applies to partnerships. So you will have to do uh, make that same decision for partnerships as you would for sole traders. Are you going to keep the same year end? Are you going to extend it? Um, so that you, you bring it in line with the fiscal year or not. So Jeremy Linton, yes, is the answer to that. Um, second one, is it also um, OK to put on two separate sets of accounts for two accounting periods if it gives a better, more optimal result? For example, if someone wants, to tran wants transition profit to be higher and if the later period has more profit in it rather than straight line apportionment? That is a very good question. That was from Jane MacArthur. Thank um, you, Jane. Hope you're still here. Yeah, I think if you, I suppose if you have the time and you think there might be a difference between going for either of those two options, so either extend or create two, um, yeah, you could evaluate and see which one gives you the better tax result because um, capital allowances will have an impact on that. So whether you're going to um, extend the capital allowances for that kind of stretched period or whether you're going to um, have effectively two periods of, of capital allowances that could influence it, uh, and also the uh, the rate of profit that you're making over that period of time, because a long period is apportioned evenly, or assumed to be apportioned evenly uh, across that time. Whereas if you're if you're chopping it into different periods, you might find that short period is either highly profitable or um, add less profits than the kind of average over the period of time. So all those things can factor in. You can make a tax based decision on it, but. In all honesty, I think for most clients, I don't think I'd be going to the effort of preparing two sets of scenarios, seeing what the difference is tax-wise, unless there was something obvious that's going to make a difference, like you had a big yes. capital asset acquisition that fell one way or the other. That yeah, might, otherwise might it's a lot it. of work just to figure it out. So Jane yeah. does say uh, that um, she hasn't thought about it a lot yet, but <laughs> imagine there might be different results. So it's it's just one of those considerations. Yeah. Um, and Margaret asks, can overlap profits be offset against the existing accounting period if year end is retained? Uh, yes, so the overlap profit will automatically go against the second period. So if you're retaining it, that estimated um, amount that I put in the example, the 40,000, um, the bit of that that relates to that extra chunk, that's what your overlap profit will be set against. So even if you're retaining the non 5th of April year end, the overlap profit will be set against the transition part and there'll be no carry forward whatsoever of any overlap profit after 23, 24. He's good, isn't he? He's good. Um, I've got another one. So Julie Licorice. Hello, Julie. Um, 
She's asking, can we use the 31st of March as the same as the 5th of April? If the client only has one self-employment, I presume you don't need to send a PDF of accounts with tax return. Yes, that's absolutely right. So um, this applies to, so year ends between 31st of March and 5th of April are treated as if they are 5th of April. Um, so yeah, you can choose any date between 31st of March, 5th of April, you won't have the problem. Fantastic. You can, weirdly, opt out of that automatic treatment of the same if you wanted to weirdly keep 31st of March and do this odd little sort of calculation every year. But no, by default, 31st of March, anywhere between 31st of March and 5th of April. Is just treated, treat is that? Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, now, I'm, I am conscious that Martin is here with a lot to talk about around uh, some of the practice management stuff. But I've got one more question. We're going to stop at Colin's question about basis period. Um, Colin asks, changing basis period is necessary for MTD. What happens if that return is on a different quarterly series? Okay. Um, the thing that irks me a little bit <laughs> with MTD is that basis period reform only came about really because HMRC couldn't figure out how to manage basis periods under MTD for income tax. And this is just one of a whole number of things that I feel they've lobbied to change the tax rules to make the introduction of MTD for income tax easier. Um, and if MTD never happens, the legacy we are left with is this <laughs> tax year basis um, and this transitional year. Um, in my mind, I always see the same as MTD for VAT. I, I don't relate that to the accounts. I see that as an independent exercise for just purely for VAT purposes. So it doesn't really matter if your VAT returns aren't coterminous with um, your accounting period. For MTD for income tax, they're forced to be coterminous with the tax year now. Um, but actually, I still see that as a bit of a separate exercise. The, I, I would be submitting those quarterly bookkeeping um, figures effectively to HMRC every quarter. And then I would go through exactly the same routine that I do today for pre preparing the end of year accounts. So I wouldn't be particularly relating the two. Um, so you don't need to change the year end just um, because that client is going to fall within MTD. You can keep your old year end um, if you want to, and I would treat MTD for income tax quarterly returns just as I would MTD VAT returns as a bit of a separate exercise to the end of year accounts creation and submission process. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dean. Thanks for your questions, everybody. We're going to draw a line under basis period reform. We could do several hours on that. Um, quick question from me to you. Quiz question two. Let's see who's still there. Um, so I've got a question here. The to-do list has been around since the invention of writing. But who cre was credited as the father, the godfather, indeed, of the to-do list after he developed his 13-week plan for cleanliness and temperance? So answers in the chat, if you would. Who is seen as the godfather of the to-do list? Oh, Margaret. Straight She's in. Straight, Margaret, She's straight, straight in. in. Straight in. Margaret Walker, <laughs> congratulations. Jeremy, wasn't, <laughs> and it wasn't your boss, Rosie. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, big credit out there to Margaret. Well done. Um, but that is potentially a shoehorn, isn't it? Martin? It's a, it's a slight shoe. About the to-do yeah. list. Um, I'm, I'm concerned, though, because I've no idea I'm going to follow Dean. So, well, just, um, you, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you'll do great. Okay. Just <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you've been doing on the practice management side. Um, okay, so uh, we've had a lot of conversations with, um, with our customers um, over the, the last nine months, um, 18 months, um, on various things that we can do to improve the product. Um, probably seen with uh, releases over the back end of last year into this year, um, a lot of changes that have happened. Um, we'll touch on a couple of those today, um, but I know, Andy, that you wanted um, just to me to bring up a conversation we had with Lorraine um, a few Ellison, weeks ago, yeah. um, which kind of is typical really of the types of issues that we're still um, kind of having with, um, with customers when they're coming on to use our PM tools. Um, and pretty much that is that the tools that we provide um, are there to assist and to drive um, work through their system. Um, but there are certain things when people first start using practice management tools that have to be decided. There has to be an onboarding process where you decide how you want to work. Um, and generally, if you're using another system or even spreadsheets, you want to bring that into, um, in our case, TaxCalc, and you want to make sure that that way that you're working flows through the system. So, um, so I think when we discussed this with Lorraine, she was aware of the 
the way that the system worked, but actually things weren't immediately set up um, as she expected. Um, and hopefully she'll be um, happy for us to say that obviously that resonated that it's the start point and she realised that she had to then go back, spend a bit of time maybe with our um, professional services team, go through the templates and try and understand how these things actually need to start. And once you've got them set up, you're literally off and running, but it's the first part of that. So I was just going to touch on that to start with. Um, so from um, Tatskalk, I'm just going to jump into, I know you like your little tips, Andy, so you don't always have to go back to um, the menu to go to admin. You can go into help and application settings, which takes you into admin center. We go into practice manager um, and then down to job templates. Um, so the template area and what our professional services team generally will do is start here. Um, and a lot of the time they're facilitating, facilitating a conversation with, um, with our customers as they start to um, onboard to get them to talk to each other internally of how they want to work. We do provide some default templates. So we've got um, these set at the bottom here, but generally they're a starter for 10. They're not what we would want somebody to use directly because it has to be the way that you want to work um, as a practice. Um, so we'll just touch on, again, a couple of bits that we discussed with, um, with Lorraine when we were having a conversation a few weeks ago. And the first was that not everything has to be a full workflow, a full advanced workflow. We do have the ability, so I'll jump into this template here. We have the ability to create checklists. So a checklist job is a job that has uh, a due date for that whole job. Um, and that job is assigned to one individual person. So it has the same due date um, for all of the items within it, assigned to one person, but you're able to break that down individually into separate items so that you can just check them off as you're doing um, the work. And then once they're all complete, that job's then done. So it's ideal for something like an onboarding checklist or a new staff uh, member checklist if you just want to, to onboard a new staff member. Um, so I don't think Lorraine at that point was aware that we had the, the checklist type jobs. Um, so that's something um, if you're similarly not aware of that you might want to have a, have a look at. So we can create templates for those or just bespoke, bespoke jobs. And then on to our full workflow template. So again, we'll just jump into an example here just with an accounts template. Um, and these are where your full workflow and the power of our workflow comes in, where you can actually break your tasks down individually. Um, so here, I think we've got about 12, 12 separate stages, um, and each of those can have their own due date, um, can be assigned um, to an individual. And we'll pop into here, we can also assign them to a team or to a role, um, which is a change that we did towards the end of last year. Um, so if all of your clients have a certain, um, say, tax manager or VAT manager assigned to them, the job when it's created will automatically pick up that person as the assignee. Um, and that basically allows you to break that down into exactly how you want to work, which is what I was touching on, where Lorraine kind of felt she made a mistake initially, that actually there were tasks in there that she either didn't need or maybe ones that were missing. Um, and I think the most important part of this, and kind of what we touched on with the professional service team focusing on this area, weirdly, everyone does work differently. Even though a tax job and an accounts job will follow similar steps, there's tiny nuances that affect the way that that work needs to follow through into the, um, from one stage to the next. Um, here we have 12 or um, I think 13 stages. We have some people have five stages. Some people that we've looked at before have 25 stages within a job. So it really depends um, on what's important to you and how you want to work. So I wonder whether a quick question to everybody might be how many stages, let's say an accounts, accounts job template, how many stages would you imagine you would have or have you got within the system if you use TaxCalc at the moment? But it does vary, like I say, from five up to 25, 30 that we've seen Put your before. question answers in the chat to that one. How many stages in your in your process? It'd be interesting to see. Okay, so I'm mindful of mindful of time. I know we've still got some stuff to cover. So just segueing onto that slightly with another feature that's actually hot off the press. So this has uh, gone out in our spring release, which literally went GA, um, I think, today. Um, so everybody should now have a notification um, just up in the top right-hand corner here. So we should have an update available notification. Um, we can pop our spring release on. Um, and what we've done is we've just extended um, the way that we're able to pretty much report on the statuses of work. So you can see from these templates, the templates we have, you could pretty much do for any type of activity that you have within the practice. So if I just pop into here, I could create one for payroll and bookkeeping and um, other things that we may want to track work with. So the system already caters for that. But if you're doing something that um, where the work isn't actually residing within tax counts, so for example, payroll and bookkeeping, Previously, we weren't able to actually have a, an item of work that we could then track the work status against. And that's what we've added into our spring release. So I'm going to jump back to um, Practice Manager. Actually, have I got two seconds as well? So just maybe one other, one other question. So on our dashboard, 
um, that we've got here. I noticed when Dean did his um, demo earlier, he started on the launcher. So another quick question for, um, for the attendees might be, which one do you start TaxCalc with? So you actually start on your launcher or do you start on your dashboard when you first open TaxCalc? Type launcher or dashboard. Let's see what everyone is doing. Um, by the way, Daniel Mercer claims to have a three-step process. For his there you go. Very good. Yep, so three steps, whereas some have 30. Some so that yep. shows that it really is down to how people want to work. So we're going to jump into Practice Manager. And again, I'll just touch on this a little bit because it's maybe a separate session we'll do. Can I just say it's a 50-50 yep. split launcher dashboard? Okay, which is good, yep. which is good. Um, so you'll notice on our spring release um, that we've got an option down here for non tax calc works. That's items of work that aren't dealt with within tax calc. So tax accounts, VAT, we deal with, confirmation statement. These are other items of work. I've set these already within admin, but there's an option in admin center to turn these on. So when you first see this option, you have a little prompt that will take you to admin to turn these on. Um, but I'm gonna just go to um, dump for towers. And then we can see here that we've got um, some items of work um, highlighted. So I can come into here and I can then actually create that period. So this is what we couldn't do previously. We couldn't create periods that could then hold a work item status against these other types of work. So we're now able to do that. Um, if I just reset this again and then pop into our client list, um, we can, in addition, add columns in. So for those of you that haven't used the column um, settings previously, we've talked about that, I think, on a few um, of the Power Hours before. So we can change these columns and we've actually now added additional columns for these other work items where we can uh, keep an eye on the latest period and the status of that period from here. And then if I look at Research Limited, so if I put to Work Management, and then just quickly pop into Research Limited, so we can see on here I've got my payroll job. If I go to Edit My Payroll Job and go to Client Details, I can then actually allocate that item of work to the job, and I can track the work item status then within that job, again, which we couldn't do previously. You could have the job there, but you couldn't actually track the work item status. And pretty much, basically, that work item status is what we then report on. So back to the dashboard, we've got our dashboards on here. Um, if I go to switch a dashboard to a work status dashboard, we're then able to um, add an additional uh, widget for these additional work types. So for example, payroll, if I scroll down, I can then add a widget that actually allows me to keep a, an overall view. We can report on this as well, but keep an overall view of the stages and the statuses of that work for work that's not done within TaxCalc. So you were able to um, delight Lorraine. With, Hopefully. That was her, her specific Hopefully. question. She was was, I want to work she outside of, track my work outside of TaxCalc. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing all of that. Um, so we haven't got any questions. If you've got anyone got any questions, uh, by the way, Graham did say he's never even used the launcher or realised it's an option. There so we go. now you did. Do you want to quickly just 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 for for Graham's sake just show again? Show again. Yep. So by default, generally you'll appear on the launcher. Um, so within TaxCalc, that's kind of our default. But down bottom right hand corner, it's just an option for dashboard. Um, you'll get a standard dashboard for free. You can add your widgets on there if you're using um, PM Plus as it. Um, stands, then you could have multiple dashboards, so you don't have to stay with, with one. Okay. Uh, Catherine's got a quick question. How do you turn over to 2324? Uh, might need a tiny bit more information. If, if it's um, a job for a tax return, um, so a tax return rolling over, then once you get our spring release, the spring release has um, a switch in there that once that return is available, the returns are then created off the back of those jobs um, that previously would have recurred and couldn't create that return yeah, um, on the previous that's... release. Yeah, I presume that yeah. was the, the So question. that should happen from Spring once you've updated on Spring. So I've got one question. Uh, Mylena uh, has asked about, um, I'm not sure whether this is, or where you are with this, but um, when, when the email will feed through to the vault from the practice management software. So I presume, so, you talking about inbound email? Uh, so, so we have automation with um, outbound email with our comm center uh, request for records. Um, so within Communication Centre, if you um, set up automation and your request for records email is generated into our pending queue, at the point that you send those emails from our pending queue, um, there's automation on our jobs um, and our job templates where once you send that, it can complete that particular task for the request for records, which is normally your, your first stage, I guess, of your job. So that automation is in there from a request for records as long as you're using Comm Centre. So I, I, that, that, hopefully that's the question there. There's... Um 
that's coming in from Mylena. I believe that, hopefully that's answered your question, Mylena. Um, Catherine says, can a report be printed for tax return information showing what was on the previous year's return? Again, might need a little bit more information on that if it's to do with values or... This might be you, one, Dean. Um, can yeah, I? you can use the questionnaire. Um, so they're very popular with um, people wanting to request the information for the next tax year. So you can choose a couple of different options. You can either um, just leave it kind of fully blank, a big series of questions. Do you have this source of income? Do you have that source of income? Or you can have that pre-populate with the last year's figures so that your client can see what was on um, the tax return in the previous year. So presumably, yeah, that's just saying this is what you did last year. Now I need this for Yeah, effectively you're year. asking for this year's information, but it will show the previous years on that report so the, the client can see what they had last year. Okay. Um, Mylena's asking if she, she wants to know how to activate that. So Mylena, do you have communication centre activated in your licence is the question I would ask you. We may need to come back to you. Maybe you, if, if, there, if you do and you haven't got it set up, I suggest you give our support guys a call and they'll help you in no time at all. Um, okay, so let's move on um, and we're going to look at the ECCT next. Okay. Um, so, question for you all. I'm not sure if the glitch is back. Um, I think we should probably just move straight on to the ECCT. Okay. If possible. Right, ECCT, Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. A um, whole raft of mes uh, measures form part of that bill, um, but the first first elements of those came into effect from 5th of March. So if I go into the software, I will just show you some of the changes to look out for. So if I go into um, Practice Manager, and I'll use this client as an example, Beaumont Limited. Um, so a couple of changes to note from 5th of March 24, any company clients should have a registered email address that they will need to provide to company's house on their next confirmation statement. So you don't need to send uh, everything to company's house at once. This will only go to company's house on their next confirmation statement. Or if you're forming a new company, it will be a requirement of the um, part of the formation process that you will um, provide them with a registered email address. So within our software, we can see here in the contact information section in the client record, uh, if we select, uh, select that existing email address, go to edit, we've now got a checkbox there just to identify that as a registered email address. Do check with your client what email address they want to go to company's house. Um, it doesn't sit on the public record, so people won't be able to download everyone's email addresses from company's house. It will just be visible at company's house's end, but they do want a working registered email address, and that's where you can uh, update it on our software. Uh, another item that's introduced that you can no longer use PO boxes for uh, registered office addresses. So we can see in this case we're going to have to um, get the client to come up with a new address that isn't a PO box uh, and we can change this on the contact record. If you're wondering uh, a quick way of finding out whether any of your clients are using PO box addresses you could run a report of all the addresses and, and do a bit of a search. Um, I might go into um, edit address and just click on the global address book and just do a quick search just to give me an idea how many addresses I have in the system that are PO boxes. So I can see there's one in here. Um, this isn't going to tell me which client it relates to, so it's just to give me a quick idea of um, how big a problem or not it is for my clients. Uh, but you probably want to run a report um, to, to actually um, come up with exactly which clients are affected and will need to update with Companies House. So if I just change that address in here, um, if I then come out of the client record, I shall finish and save that information. Then I'll get a little pop-up just telling me that uh, I need to file a form to notify Companies House of that change in um, registered office address and I can do that from here um, directly if I want to or I can come back at a later point and do that. Uh, one thing I do want to show you as well, if I open this in Companies House Forms is the confirmation statement. So if I just create a new confirmation statement for this particular client, um, 
And a quick question, we've got the confirmation date, this is already set up as 25th of May, but from next month, what will be by a long way the most popular date, filing date for a confirmation statement moving forward? Put your answers in the chat if you think you know what the most popular uh, recurring confirmation date will be uh, in future for your confirmation statements. I'll just let those flow in. Um, you'll notice in, if you're doing your confirmation statements in our software, we've got this extra little option down the bottom there. This will pick up whether this is the first confirmation statement that you've done since 5th of, April, uh, 5th of March for this particular client, uh, and then populate that register email address from the record. Uh, if it's not in there, then you, you can update it here just as we did on the, the client record. Uh, once that's gone in, you won't see this option again because you, don't, uh, you won't file any future change on the confirmation statement. There'll be a separate form if you've submitted a registered email address and wish to change it in future. Um, so yes, I think lots of correct answers flowing into the chat there, 30th of April. Lots of 30th of April's. Yeah, that's exactly what I do and the reason being is that the company's house filing fees are going up from 1st of May. So your £13 confirmation statement filing fee is going to go up to a whopping £34. Ooh. So for any clients I've got that would be filing uh, confirmation statements within the next one, two, three months, I would be bringing that forward 30th of April, save them 21 quid. Yep. Happy days, they'll buy your pint down the pub. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner, including the publican. Fabulous. Thank you for that, Dean. Um, we've got l a few questions here. Again, sorry about the, the technical difficulties. We're, we're thinking it may be something external. Um, so we'll probably um, wrap up and skip and bring some of the things that uh, Martin was going to talk around uh, into the next session. Um, just a quick question. So Jane MacArthur, um, she said, um, is there any chance you can make the uh, client questionnaire um, which he describes as good, which is, I think, I think a good thing, um, <laughs> into some sort of secure web form integration so the replies can be received in the spreadsheet format. I'm sure you'll drop that into the product team's inbox. Yeah, I mean, it's inbox. an excellent suggestion. I think people are wanting to work more collaboratively in that way with clients and get the information in the digital form so that we can fire it into the software yeah. um, a bit quicker than, than retyping. So, yeah, great suggestion. Um, I can't promise that. Um, any time soon, but it's certainly something that we're we're working towards. I'll promise it, and then you can you can blame me. Um, okay, look, I do apologise once again for the technical difficulties. What we'll do is say so bring some of the um, areas that, that Martin was going to talk about um, uh, around. Uh, we had a, a brilliant question that we were dealing with from Phil Newton. Hi, Phil, if you're still out there, um, relating to um, accounting for. Um, uh, irregular work rather than just regular work and generating reports on that. But I think we'll draw a line under today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your wonderful um, uh, wise words and assistance. We will be back on the 10th of April. We've got Lucy Brown from Calathea who joined us on the last power hour, actually. Um, but she'll be back with Mike, um, her partner at Calathea, uh, and they will be looking at um, the, the, the process rather than the software when it comes to AML compliance and uh, revisiting some of the uh, stories that uh, they told us when they came and visited us last year. We will be at the Digital Accounting Show uh, on the 16th, 17th. Um, so come and see us there at Battersea Park if you are in the area. Until then, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful Easter. Thank you once again for joining. Take care. Bye bye.